All right, as the precious children are going to their special program, let's uh, take our Bibles this morning and open them to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 31, beginning at verse 13. Lord willing, trying to cover verses 13 through 21 this morning. As God continues to deal with Jacob, Jacob has made a trip from Canaan, the western circle, because of the murderous rage of his brother. It's sort of interesting how a trial can put you directly into God's will. <laughs> and that's what happened to Jacob. He had to flee up to Haran. And he's been there for probably now about 20 years. He's now got two wives, two maidservants, 11 sons and a daughter. That's a lot of stuff going up there in Haran. He's a busy guy, I guess. And God says, all right, it's time to come back from Haran up north to the land of your birth. Some of your Bible translations will say the land of your nativity. And what happens as God is moving Jacob from Haran back to the land of Canaan, and this is a message, by the way, that we have entitled Two to Three Witnesses. How do you know if you're in God's will? Well, there's an ancient principle at work. You'll see it here. You'll see it in your own life. It's, it says, let a matter be established from two to th by two to three witnesses. More on that as we progress. But his circumstances have changed. There's been a change of relationship with Laban. Laban is now hostile towards Jacob. And Jacob, of course, has received a word from God, divine revelation. It's time to leave Haran and go back to Canaan. And so Jacob now has to convince his wives, plural, that this is going to happen. Which to me is a very interesting conversation because to convince your spouse of anything <laughs> is difficult. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. My wife down here didn't say amen. She just, <laughs> she just given me a cold stare, you know. But he's got two wives he's got to convince. And what's sort of interesting is his wives didn't know anything about Canaan. They had lived their whole lives in Haran. And he's got to convince them that it's time to go, to leave everything you know, and you've got to go to a land where you have never been before. So he summons his wives, verse 4, it's sort of a private talk in the field, away from the tent. And he lays out the case, verses 5 through 13. And part of it is Laban and his attitude towards me has now changed. Laban's attitude has changed. Laban has been dishonest, even though I have been very diligent. And beyond that, God has given me a word. The revelation is given in verse 3. More is going to be said about this revelation, but he describes this revelation. He sees a vision. He sees an interpretation. And then God gives him a command to leave Haran and go back to Canaan. And so we pick it all up there in verse 13. God speaking to Jacob as Jacob is trying to describe what happened to his wives. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now arise and leave this land and return to the land of your birth. 
A very interesting passage for a lot of different reasons. The first of which is, you'll notice it says, I am the God of Bethel. That's interesting because verse 11 says, the angel of God said to me in the dream. And there's so much debate today in theological circles. Well, who's the angel of the Lord? To me, it's very simple. The angel of the Lord is mentioned in verse 11. And then we learn that it was actually God who was speaking to Jacob via the angel of the Lord. And so the angel of the Lord is none other than Jesus himself, God in human flesh, except this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. It's what's called in theology a theophany or a Christophany. Jesus Before the Manger, one of my favorite books on this subject, I think I mentioned it last week, is the book by Dr. Ron Rhodes. Jesus Before the Manger, where he identifies every such pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus prior to the virgin birth of Christ. Fascinating study. I hope you don't look at the person of Jesus as if he's just kind of a New Testament figure. Jesus is a New Testament doctrine. No, Jesus has always been. He has always been and he will always be. What happened at the virgin conception is humanity was added. Not subtract, There's no exchange or subtraction. Humanity was added to eternally existent deity. And at the point of the virgin conception, he became the God-man. But he has always existed as God. He is the uncaused cause. And in fact, if it were not for him, the angels wouldn't exist. You wouldn't exist. Creation itself wouldn't exist. Jesus is not just your and our redeemer. He's our creator. He's always been and he will always be. Having a a correct biblical understanding of Jesus. Not just a New Testament figure. But very, very active throughout the pages of the Old Testament as well. And this verse 13, referencing back to verse 11, becomes really one of the great ways to prove that or to demonstrate it. Verse 13 says, I am the God of Bethel. Now, what's interesting about Bethel is that whole situation occurred in Genesis 28, verse 19, 20 years earlier. Back in uh, Genesis 28, verse 19, this is 20 years prior, it says, He called, that's Jacob, called the name of the place Bethel, which literally means house of God. It's a compound word, two words making up a singular word in Hebrew, Bayet, house, El, God, house of God. He called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the city had been named Luz. And so here's 20 years have passed and God is reminding Jacob of an experience that he had 20 years earlier at Bethel. And what's interesting is Jacob's life has changed a lot over 20 years. I mean, his family, he went there with no money, uh, fleeing as a fugitive, and now look at him. He's wealthy, he's more mature, at least we hope. (laughs) He's certainly growing as far as I can tell as I'm reading the story of Jacob. He's got a family that's massive, and things in his life have changed. His relationship with Laban has changed. His relationship with Laban's sons has changed, and yet God hasn't changed. Um, The book of Malachi, last book in the Old Testament, how we as Protestants have organized the Old Testament. You'll run into a prophet named Malachi. Some have called him Malachi, the Italian prophet. (laughs) But in Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, God says this through the prophet Malachi, 
I, the Lord, do not change. And I find that very refreshing because we're living in a world that's changing all of the time. And yet as you walk with the Lord, you have something stable in your life that doesn't change. And I'm sure glad God doesn't change because God, if he changed, I guess could say, you know those sins that I forgave you in 1983 when you trusted me as your savior? Ah, I don't forgive those anymore. Do you realize that in the system of Islam, that's what they believe in terms of their God? They believe Allah is a deceiver and can change his mind. That's why under Islamic doctrine, there's such fear. You're going to get to that final judgment and maybe you're in, maybe you're not. And maybe God made you a promise, but changed his mind. Do you, do you see how superior Christianity is to such a archaic pagan system as Islam? Where you serve a God that does not change. He is absolutely 100% Immutable is the fancy theological term for it. So Jacob, things in your life have changed, but I'm still the same God. And I'm going to remind you of what happened 20 years earlier at Bethel. You'll notice there in verse 13, Genesis 31, it says, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me, now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. This goes back 20 years to Genesis 28, verses 18 through 20. It says there, just a few verses, it says, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me on this journey that I take, and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, something you need when you don't have any resources, which is what his economic condition was when he left the land of his birth for Haran. And I returned to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be called God's house. And all of that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. In other words, Jacob, you made a vow. I'm keeping my part, and I want you to keep your part. You don't keep your part because I might rip out the carpet from under you concerning my part, because I don't change. But the reasonable thing for you to do, given the grace that I have shed upon you, is to submit to my will. And in this case, my will is, and it was mentioned there in Genesis 28, 20 years earlier, you're going to come back into the land of your birth, the land of your nativity. Probably tempting for Jacob to think, well, I, I kind of like it here in Haran. I've gotten rich in Haran. I've gotten a big family in Haran. I left here with no money and I was fleeting, fleeing as a fugitive. You know, I like being comfortable. And God says, no, I want you to remember your vow where you pledge to submit to my authority. And now, Jacob, it's time for you to fulfill your vow. Do what's reasonable. Do what's logical. Since I've so blessed you, the least you could do is submit to my authority. Not because, oh, I'm going to throw you into hell if you don't. Romans um, chapter 12, in verse 1 in the New Testament, Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, my, my brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. What is the logical thing for a Christian to do with their life? It is to submit to the authority of Jesus. A lot of Christians think if they don't submit to the authority of Jesus, then Jesus is going to pull out the carpet from under them. That is not so. Your promises from God are unchangeable because God is immutable. Then why should we submit to the authority of Jesus? Because that's what's logical. 
the book of Romans says that's your, that's your, that's your reasonable, logical aspect of your spiritual service unto God. So submission to the Lordship of Christ, submission to the authority of Christ is, is not something that is done through terror. Well, if you don't do this, you never got saved, Calvinism. Oh, if you don't do this and you're going to lose your salvation, Arminianism, two beliefs that we don't teach by and basically reject here at Sugarland Bible Church. So the Calvinist and the Arminian come alongside us and they say, well, how are you going to keep these people in line? I mean, if you teach them grace on Sunday, they're going to live like the devil Monday through Saturday. And I guess you could if you wanted to, but the thing is, I don't really want to do that because that doesn't even make any sense. I mean, that would be totally an illogical, irrational use of my life. Why, Paul says, in light of these mercies. What mercies are those? The ones he's unfolded in chapters 1 through 11 of Romans. In light of those mercies. The logical, irrational thing to do is to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. This is what God is saying here to Jacob. It's time for you to leave. It's time for you to submit, even though it might be more comfortable for you to stay. And your submission is logical because of the grace that I have poured out on you. Verse 13, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your nativity or your birth. God has identified himself, verse 13, the God of Bethel, and now God has given a command. Leave and go back to Canaan. Leave Haran in the north and go back to Canaan. It's time to go. What you're going to see in the Bible as you study it is God is really good. I mean, he's really good at this. Is taking the people out of the land of Israel. This is still Canaan. It hasn't even been named the land of Israel yet. In fact, the name Israel hasn't even been mentioned yet in Genesis. I believe that's coming in chapter 32, if I'm not mistaken. But God is really good at taking his people who are outside of the land and bringing, back, bringing them back into their homeland. This uh, happened with Abraham, Genesis 12, who fled into Egypt, you'll recall. And God said to Abraham, it's time to go back into the land of Canaan. You will recall that this happened with Abraham's servant, Genesis 24, as the servant was seeking a wife for Isaac. It's time for you, the servant, to leave Haran and come back into the land of Israel. In fact, this is actually the story of the Bible when you think about it. The nation of Israel is outside of the land and they come back into the exact same land. This is what is predicted for the Egyptian sojourn. It's predicted in Genesis 15, 13 through 14. God says you're going to go into Egypt, but 400 years later, you're going to go right back into your land. Fulfilled, by the way, in the book of Joshua. And then 800 years is going to progress and the nation of Israel is going to become progressively sinful. So they're going to leave their land again and go 350 miles to the east into a place called Babylon. But they're going to be recycled right back into that same land as recorded in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And then the same thing is going to happen 40 years after the time of Jesus. The nation is going to be pushed into what is called the diaspora, the worldwide dispersion. And they're going to be recycled back into that same land. The prophet Ezekiel predicted it. So I guess my question is, if God did it once with Egypt and did it a second time in terms of the return from Babylon, do you really think God can do it a third time? <laughs> In fact, I would say this, that third time there is happening right now. 
the nation of Israel has been miraculously reborn. The miracle on the Mediterranean, one of the key signs of the time period that we are living in today. The super sign, as some have called it, for the last days. What is the definitive sign that we are in the last days? Is it microchip technology? Is it the World Economic Forum? Is it all of these other things? Those are all interesting signs, but the super sign is the recycling of the Jews back into their ancient homeland. That is something, a people group being displaced from their land for 2,000 years in worldwide dispersion, and yet God says it's time to go back, and they go right back into the same land that they were kicked out of 2,000 years earlier, and they've got their same religion and their languages revived. Show me another example of this in world history. No such thing has ever happened. And yet this idea of out, back in, you're seeing it right here with, with Jacob. It's, it's a prefigurement, if you will, of the pattern of God throughout the pages of his word. So he has convinced his wives by presenting the case that it's time to go. God told me it's time to go. And watch the response of the wives. I mean, you think they would drag their feet. I mean, we like the shopping malls here in Haran. Is there a Macy's in Canaan? Um, I don't, you know, not that all women ask those kind of questions, but sometimes men ask those questions more than women. What's the comfort level like? Um, what kind of house are we going to live in? I mean, these wives, I would think, could have just totally dragged their feet. But because they answered the way they did, God confirmed the matter to Jacob and to them through the mouth of two to three witnesses. They kind of have the attitude that let's get out of here. We can't get out of here fast enough. They start to talk about their loss of inheritance under Laban. And you see that there uh, in verse 14. Genesis 31 and verse 14, Rachel and Leah, two wives, said to him, do we have any portion or inheritance in our father's house? Now, the way this is set up is linguistically, it's a question that expects a negative answer. In other words, no, we don't have an inheritance. Why not? Well, if you go back to verse 1, Laban had now had sons which didn't exist when Jacob came into Haran. 20 years have passed, now he has sons. And so the attitude of the wives is, now that Laban has had sons, verse 1, the daughters of Laban, Leah and Rachel, would inherit nothing. So why would we stick around here? And then they talk about their loss of dowry, verse 15, they say, are we not reckoned by him, that's Laban, as foreigners? Now, this is a question that expects a positive answer. The question in verse 14 expects a negative answer. The question in verse 15 expects a positive answer. We are like foreigners. In other words, Laban sold us for 14 years of labor by Jacob to Laban. So we're, we're as good a, a, as foreigners to Laban. And then the second part of verse 15, for he, that's Laban, has sold us and has also entirely consumed our purchase price. He has devoured our money. Our dowry, so to speak, has been taken away. In other words, Laban did not use Jacob's 14 years of service to financially provide for his daughters. I mean, he had 14 years of service. Obviously, he saved some kind of money or gained some kind of financial benefit during that time period. And none of it went to the financial provision for the future of his daughters. Laban's flocks had increased because of Jacob's presence. And none of that increase went to his daughters. 
sort of a sad situation. Laban was even violating the customs of the day by not providing anything for his daughters. Now, you'll notice here Arnold Fruchtenbaum makes reference to the Newsy tablets. You probably haven't spent a lot of your devotional time this week in the Newsy tablets, but I like to reference them a lot in our study of the book of Genesis to tell you that the Newsy tablets and something that's going to be mentioned a little later called the Code of Hammurabi furnish the archaeological background explaining that what is happening in these patriarchal accounts is history. In other words, what we're reading about in the Bible accommodates to the culture of the day. This is not Jack and the Beanstalk. This is not story time. This is actual history. The Nuzi tablets are clay tablets that were discovered near Kirkuk, Iraq in the 1920s. They date back to the mid-second millennium B.C. when Nuzi was part of uh, Haran, in essence. They contain family archives and legal documents that shed light on everyday life and customs of that time period of those in Haran and their neighbors in Mesopotamia. Some of these customs, such as the tablets of sistership, may have parallels with the biblical patriarchs who lived in the same region 700 years earlier. Arnold Fruchtenbaum writes this, According to the Newsy tablets, the father of the bride was to give some of the bride price money for the groom to the bride. Jacob did not give money to Laban, but he gave him seven years of service for each wife. However, no part of Jacob's work was given to the daughters. None of the increase of the flock was set aside for the daughters. Now notice this, Fruchtenbaum says... This went contrary even to the custom of their own territory. Because the Newsy tablets indicate that this is what people normally did. But he ignored it. Therefore, Laban would resort to a local custom if it were to his benefit. Remember he did that with Leah? Hey, you gave me Leah instead of Rachel. Oh, that's what we do here all the time, local custom. But then... When it came to a local custom in terms of financial provision, he would ignore it. This is what kind of duplicity you're dealing with in this character called Laban. Therefore, Laban would result to a local custom if it were to his benefit. He would go against it if it did not benefit him. Not Jacob, but Laban was the cheat here. This is the point that Jacob is making in his presentation to his wives. I've been mistreated. And kind of interesting, the wives don't jump to the defense of the father, but they say, yeah, we know the guy, our father is a real rip-off artist. It's kind of interesting that when we behave in an unethical way, our family members know what's going on. You can only hide so much. And I guess as a way of application, we could ask, what kind of testimony do you have to your immediate family, your congregation in your church? Because I have a church here at Sugarland Bible Church, but it's not my primary church. My primary church is to my family. You have the same thing. You have a immediate circle of friends and particularly family members that you have influence over. And your congregation within your family is developing a mindset concerning your character. They're watching you all of the time. Professionally, you can fool a lot of people. But your capacity to fool your own family members, you'll start to discover, is extremely limited. Your family knows you better than anybody else. What kind of legacy are you leaving them? What is our reputation in our first circle of influence, our family. Laban had a lousy uh, reputation. And the daughters say, yeah, we know he's doing all this stuff. He's treating us like foreigners. In addition, he has not been good with his finances. He has taken his prosperity, and we haven't seen a dime. 
Which is interesting because there's actually a biblical purpose for prosperity. Why does God prosper people? Why does God prosper Christians? And by prosperity, what I mean is you have the ability to have things, income, revenue, that's above and beyond the necessities of life. Most of the world doesn't have that. Many people in the United States of America do. What are you supposed to do with it? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19 tells you. Instruct those who are rich. Who would the rich be? You've got more than what you need. That's rich. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies all things to enjoy Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Hey, Lord, I've got more money than what I need. I just got a raise. I just got a new job. I just got this paid off or that paid off. I've got more than I need. And the Lord says, fantastic, I gave it to you. And then we say back to the Lord, well, what should I do with it? And the Lord says, now you've got a greater opportunity for service that you didn't have before. Now you've got more in your hands to be generous with that you didn't have before. The purpose of prosperity. This uh, is something that Laban had. I mean, Jacob's presence gave Laban this, and he he didn't do what God wanted. I've noticed that, that when I don't do what God wants with my resources, he says, you know what, I think I'll take those away. And I'll I'll give them to someone else that's going to appropriate them correctly. Because, by the way, when you give financially, it's like the Lord is giving through you to somebody else. He just uses you as sort of the intermediary. You're like the channel. But then we say to ourselves, you know what, I'm going to cut this off and uh, maybe I shouldn't be so generous. And then the Lord says, well, you forgot the purpose of prosperity. You're no longer an effective channel. I think what I'll do is I'll re-siphon this, these resources to somebody else. The budget here at Sugarland Bible Church, to me, is just sort of unbelievable. Um, how the Lord, with us not even passing the plate, how the Lord has been able to provide for this church far above and beyond what we need it's just sort of mind-boggling and at some point you got to ask yourself well why do we have this he wants to use us as a vessel to bless other people that's why we have it and if we ever stop using it as a vessel to bless other people i'm of the persuasion that god just shuts off the flow And he'll send it to someone else that's going to be more pliable. You see, the the purpose of prosperity. We've preached so much against the prosperity gospel. You know, the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it theology. That we've, I think, we've been so aggressive preaching against that, we've given people the impression that prosperity is wrong. It is not wrong. It's actually biblical. It's not a guarantee, but God can and does bless people. But with the blessing comes a responsibility. You know, you look at the United States of America, how it's just been radically blessed compared to other nations of the earth. And America has been faithful in using that excess to send out missionaries and be a blessing to other nations, but isn't it interesting that as our nation becomes more narcissistic 
and more and more godless, the more we're starting to have economic problems. It's, it's almost like God is saying, you know what, you're not going to be faithful with your prosperity. Um, I'm going to send it to somebody else. And almost every time you pick up the newspaper today and read about the progress of the United States of America, it's one financial problem after another. Maybe the problem in the United States is we got, we got some wrong priorities. Maybe we need to get back to God and God's word and be one nation under God, which is, it's in our, isn't that on our coins? In God we trust. That's a joke. In God we trust written on our money when it's really money we're trusting in many times and not God. Maybe I should trust God and then let him give me whatever I'm financially supposed to have. And if I have above and beyond what I need, I say, well, Lord, how can I be a blessing to somebody else? We forget that and our country changes. Economics change. I mean, we've got our, I don't mean to get off on this. Maybe I should change the subject. But, you know, you've got these guys they can't even agree on a balanced budget anymore. I mean, if your upkeep exceeds your income, uh, let me say that again. If your inflow, if your upkeep exceeds your inflow, there we go, then your upkeep will be your downfall. You cannot live beyond your means or you're going to have financial problems. How, how come we have a generation of politicians that don't understand that? Well, maybe it's because we don't understand it anymore. Look at most of our lives just recklessly financially, and we expect our elected representatives to act differently. This is a nation of the people, by the people, for the people. The elected representatives are nothing more than a reflection of our own values. You know, we really need a huge a spiritual revival in this country where we start to return to divine principles. Le bon forgot the purpose of prosperity. And now Jacob is, is leaving. As the wives continue to speak, not only are they complaining about their lack of inheritance, rightfully so, they're being treated as foreigners, a rightfully so complaint. Verse 15, for he has sold us and has also entirely consumed our purchase price. But they recognize that the wealth transfer has occurred because God allowed it. God allowed Jacob to become wealthy. Look at verse 16. Surely the wealth which God has taken away from our father belonged to us and to our children. Because Laban failed to provide as he should have for his daughters, God provided for his daughters through Jacob. And we need to understand this because if you're on the unfair side of a situation where someone has not provided for you as they should have, that puts you actually in a pretty good Select group, I should say, because when that happens to somebody, God provides. Psalm 27 and verse 10 says this. For my father and mother have forsaken me. What a painful thing that is when even those close to you, mom and dad, didn't do what they were supposed to do. For my father and mother have forsaken me, but... The Lord will take me up. That's what happened here with these two daughters, Rachel and Leah. Laban didn't do what he was supposed to do. God says, you know what? Um, I'm not limited by what Laban does do or doesn't do. I'm going to provide for you through another source. I'm going to provide for you through Jacob. Because Laban failed to provide as he should have, even violating the customs of the day, God provided for Rachel and Leah through Jacob. 
And so what do they do at the end of this conversation? They accept the fact that it's time to go. It's time to leave what we know and go to something we don't know. They say there at the end of verse 16, Rachel and Leah speaking to Jacob, now then do whatever God has said to you. See what just happened here? Jacob just got his second witness. And because there's two wives saying this, he just got his third witness. What is the ancient principle of Scripture? 2 Corinthians 13 verse 1. Every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. In fact, in ancient Israel, there was something called capital punishment to lawbreakers, but you could not put someone to death unless you had two to three witnesses watching the capital crime. And then one of the witnesses had to throw the first stone. Deuteronomy 17 verse 6, on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. 1 Timothy chapter 5, you catch an elder in immorality. You better have your two to three witnesses lined up. Because only if do you have two to three witnesses watching an elder commit, which would be something, an open sin, an open act of morality. In other words, one witness isn't enough. And this protects the elder from the rumor mill. Someone doesn't like an elder. Someone doesn't like a pastor. Let's circulate a rumor that the pastor did something wrong. Let's run him out of town. You got your two to three eyewitnesses? Because the Bible says, 1 Timothy 5, let a matter be confirmed through two to three witnesses. It's a, it's a principle that goes all the way through God's word. And the reason I'm bringing this up is God didn't just give Jacob a vision to leave. His vision was agreed to by his two wives. God is following his own rule. Let a matter be confirmed by two to three witnesses. Now, you got to pay attention to this because in your life, you're going to have to make choices. And you're going to have to ask the Lord to confirm it. You're not going to know what to do. I've been there many times. Lord, I think I'm supposed to do this, but I don't know if I'm supposed to do this. Can you please put your principle into work in my life? Let a matter be confirmed by two to three witnesses. A lot of people play this game. God told me to tell you. You ever had that happen? And I'm always wondering, why didn't God tell me himself? God doesn't work through someone coming to you and say, God told me to tell you. If that person speaking to you, God really said something to you about concerning your life, then that matter is going to be confirmed by two to three witnesses. Don't make a decision because someone said, God told me to tell you. Don't make a decision based on one witness. Ask for it to be confirmed. And don't feel like you're insulting God by asking for that because God has said this is an ancient principle that goes Old Testament, New Testament, through which I work. So here I am, uh, oh, I don't know how old I was, early 30s, I had literally worked myself to death trying to become a lawyer. It's in California. And then suddenly I start to feel that God is telling me to leave that practice, leave that state and prepare for the ministry. How do, you, how do you make that kind of a decision? You look for two to three witnesses. I feel God is leading me that direction. Witness number one. Are the finances there to afford seminary? Check. Witness number two. What does your spouse think? 
Now, in this case, I didn't have two wives. I don't recommend that. I had one beautiful wife. And she said, you should. That's a big one right there. Your spouse is on board. Check. And then I'm involved with this um, case where it's one of those kinds of cases in the legal system that never gets fixed. It just drags on and on and on. So we go before the judge and he fixed it lickety split. Because my excuse was, I can't leave because I've got this case hanging over my head. And those always take a long time. And just like that, it was fixed. Now, I would say that's a fourth witness. So circumstances were all lining up. I didn't make a choice based on one witness. I asked God to confirm it. And he did. This is what's happening here in Jacob's life. He gets a vision from the Lord. But if God has really spoken to him, certainly God has the ability to change the hearts of his wives, which he did. In fact, God was working in this way the whole 14 years because his wives were seeing their fact that they were being mistreated by Laban because they were part of his family. So God was actually using Laban and his abuse of money and his abuse of people and his deception and the fact that he changed Jacob's wages 10 times as a reason or a rationale confirming more witnesses as to why Jacob should leave. So learn that one in your walk with the Lord. Learn the principle of two to three witnesses. And so they leave Haran and they move back to the land of Canaan. You come down to verses 17 through 21 and you have Jacob's escape. Verses 17 and 18 is his preparation. Notice his preparation for his family. Genesis chapter 31, verse 17, when Jacob arose and put his children and his wives upon camels. He's got a big family now. He didn't have a big family 20 years earlier. He's got two wives, two maidservants, 11 sons, one daughter. Another son will be born, Benjamin, down the road. This is the beginning of the nation of Israel. He makes preparation for his family. He makes preparation for his property. Look at verse 18. It says, he drove away all his livestock and all his property, which he had gathered, his acquired livestock, which he had gathered in Padan Aram. Where did he get this property from? He was uh, apparently a trader, not trader like Benedict Arnold, but a trader. He traded with a D there, traded. And he had acquired a lot of property legitimately. Now that makes perfect sense because God in the Abrahamic covenant said, I will bless you. That's why his flocks have increased. His property has increased. This is property that he acquired legitimately. And he moves into his purpose. Verse 18, second part of the verse to go to the land of Canaan, to his father Isaac. Return to Isaac in Canaan, as we mentioned before, not yet the land of Israel, because the name of Israel ha hasn't even been given yet. So there he leaves up north to go back to Canaan. And watch that theme develop through the Bible. As we mentioned earlier, it's going to happen again and again and again. Outside the land, brought back into the land. Outside the land, brought back into the land. In fact, that third one, as I mentioned before, is happening right now. Gee, I wish God would do miracles today. Are you kidding me? Do you understand that when you look at the Middle East and you see the Israeli flag and you see the city of Jerusalem... Thriving with a Jewish population. And you see the nations of the earth perplexed about it. 
which is exactly what God said would exist in the end times. Do you not understand that you're seeing a modern day miracle? The, the Middle East is an absolute miracle of God. Mark Twain, as you know, went to that area in the 1870s and he said there's nothing here but goats and sand. In fact, I don't even know how these goats are surviving because there's no food out here, Mark Twain said. It must be a goat that eats rocks to survive because there's nothing here but rocks. And look at Israel today. Look at the economy. Look at the technological innovations that have come out of Israel. Look at how Israel is the subject of talk in the world community constantly. The United Nations has no idea what to do with this because it's a miracle. It's what God said would happen. And yet if you know your Bible, you know God does this all the time. No big deal. That, by the way, is how you can rest with total assurance that you're on your way to glory. There should be no doubt in your mind that if you're a Christian, you're on your way to glory. You, you shouldn't have to fear death at all as a Christian. In fact, if you are living in fear of death, you're living beneath your privileges. You know, America, with the COVID and all the things that have happened, everybody's afraid to die. There's a 0.001% chance you could die. I better hide in my house. Why, why is everybody afraid to die? Because they don't understand their future in God. How it's certain. How it's sure. I mean, if God can keep recycling his people back into the land when he says he will over and over again, don't you think God can take your soul to heaven immediately upon death? And if that's true, what are we so afraid of all the time? You know, the Bible over and over again says, do not fear. In fact, just this morning, I... I don't know where this appeared, I, maybe on my news feed, but somebody had posted Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Have you read Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 lately? He says there, Joshua 1, verse 8, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do what is in it. Verse 9, have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not tremble or be dismayed. Why not? I'm afraid, Lord. What are you afraid of? The rest of the verse says, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I think it's 365 times the Bible says, don't be afraid. And as we've said before, that's once for every day of the year. Every day you get up, the Lord says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Yeah, but the economy and the balanced budget and inflation, don't be afraid. Yeah, but COVID, don't be afraid. And yet we're so fearful. Why be fearful when God is so good at getting people to their destination? Your ultimate destination, my ultimate destination, heaven itself. A little bit here on Jacob's circumstances, verse 19. When Laban had gone to shear the flock. So in other words, when Laban's back was turned, when he was distracted, Jacob left with his family. And then you go to the second part of verse 19, and Rachel does something very interesting. When Laban had gone to shear his flock, then Rachel stole the household idols that were her father's. Now, we know that Laban was an idolater. He was involved in divining. Back in Genesis 30, verse 27, it indicates this. And Rachel, one of Jacob's wives, stole what are called the teraphim, the statute, statue, I should say, of the household gods. Why did she do that? Rachel was not an idolater. 
but she understood that the one who had the household gods could make claim on the family property. This was Rachel's attempt to gain Laban's property for Jacob. I'm not saying this is a good thing to do or a moral thing. It's just what she did. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says the Code of Hammurabi states that whoever has the household gods owns the property. The Newsy tablets record an incident of the person mentioned earlier and states, and it uses a bunch of words I can't pronounce there, but there's the actual text. The conclusion is, so owning the household gods meant the owner could claim the property. Rachel was not worshiping idols, but rather it was her attempt to gain the property of Laban for her husband, because after all, Laban has ripped off her husband. So before I leave, I'm just going to steal the teraphim to benefit my husband against my own father, who has ripped me off and has ripped him off. The following is from J.P. Free's article entitled Archaeology in the Bible and gives a good explanation of not only the episode, but also the background of the Newsy tablets. Quote, over a thousand clay tablets were found in 1925 in the excavation of a Mesopotamian site known as Yorgon Tepe, I think is how you pronounce that. Subsequent work brought forth another 3,000 tablets and revealed the ancient site as Nuzi. The tablets written around 1,500 BC illuminate the background of the biblical patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. One instance will be cited. When Jacob and Rachel left the home of Laban, Rachel stole Laban's family images or teraphim. When Laban discovered the theft, he pursued his daughter and son-in-law and after a long journey overtook them. That's coming up later in the chapter. Commentators have long wondered why he would go to such pains to recover images he could have replaced easily in the local shops. Oh, the Bible, prior to the Newsy tablets and the discovery of the Code of Hammurabi, the Bible is obviously fiction. Because he obviously doesn't care about his daughters. Why would he move heaven and earth to track them down? I mean, yeah, she stole the teraphim, but that could have just been replaced at a local shop there in Haran. It's kind of interesting. People doubt the Bible. People cast aspersions on the Bible. Just give it a little time. Because eventually what's going to happen is something is going to come out in history or archaeology that confirms this book to the core. That's what happened with the Newsy tablets discovery and the Code of Hammurabi discovery. The Newsy tablets record one instance of a son-in-law who possessed the family images having the right to lay claim to his father-in-law's property a fact which explains Laban's anxiety. If you have the teraphim, you can lay claim to his whole estate. Now, prior to 1925, prior to this discovery in archaeology, nobody knew that. His moving heaven and earth, so to speak, to track, track them down didn't make any sense. And no doubt many, many people use that as an excuse to say, well, the Bible's just fiction, ha, ha, ha. We do the real history over here in the public school classroom. You guys are just involved in religion. And isn't it interesting with the Code of Hammurabi discovery, the Newsy Tablets discovery, we now know why she stole the teraphim. And we now understand why Laban went out of his mind to get them back. Because whoever had them, according to the customs of the day, could lay claim to the entire estate. Why well, bring this stuff up? I want, you to, I want us to understand this. I say this over and over again. This is history. This actually happened. 
these stories, as they're called, confirm, conform to the customs of the day, thereby confirming the biblical account. This is why I believe God in his providence has allowed a lot of these archaeological relics to be unearthed. I mean, isn't it interesting that in an age of total skepticism against the Bible, in an age where people routinely malign and dismiss the Bible, is it not interesting that God in his providence has allowed more proof to exist for the veracity of the Bible than any other time in history? It's almost like God knew what was going to happen in terms of the human heart and postponed so many of these archaeological discoveries providentially for the last day's generation. So that men and women are without excuse. No one can say, I just didn't know. Well, the reason you don't know is you didn't take time to investigate the obvious. The, re the reason you don't know is you were careless and negligent, which is your problem. Not God's problem. Because he's provided the information and he's provided the data. Jacob's flight there is described in verse 20. Genesis 31 verse 20. And Jacob deceived Laban, the Aramean, by not telling him that he was fleeing. And then we conclude there with verse 21, which shows you where Jacob was headed. We know where he's headed, back to Canaan. Look at verse 21. So he fled with all that he had. He arose and crossed the river. Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, and it says the Euphrates River in italics, meaning Euphrates is not in the original language. It was just known as the river. And he set his face towards the hill country of Gilead. So there is Mesopotamia, where everything began. Highly likely the Garden of Eden was located generally in that part of the world. Between the rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris, it's where the Tower of Babel was built. It's where the children of Israel were taken into the 70-year captivity. Between the Euphrates and the Tigris, modern-day Iraq. It's also going to be the seat of the future Antichrist kingdom. You say, well, I don't believe you, Pastor. I have a little book on that called Babylon, the bookends of prophetic history. If you don't have that, see me afterwards. We will get that to you. But from that part of the world, the rivers branch out. The Euphrates River there uh, in the south, the Tigris up there in the north, and they keep sort of branching out until you get to Haran, Padan Aram, where Jacob was, where all of these events took place between the rivers. So obviously to leave Haran, he's got to cross the river. Not the Tigris, which was behind him, but the Euphrates, which is in front of him. And he, as he's making this trajectory, it says he set his face towards the hill country of Gilead, the mountains of Gilead being in what we would call the Transjordan. East of Canaan. So you've got Euphrates, you've got mountains of Gilead, and you've got real geography. I mean, real history, real geography. So once again, this is not just some kind of um, tall tale. This is something that conforms to the customs of the day and... It conforms to everything we know about history. And so that's Jacob's flight from Haran. The circumstances, his discussion with his two wives, and his escape. And so we're going to pick it up there next time with verse 22. As God continues to narrate for us through his word the story of Jacob. If you're here today and you don't know Christ personally, our exhortation is to place your faith exclusively in Jesus. Because God set all this up to raise up a nation so that Jesus could come to planet Earth. Look at everything God did 
to get the gospel to us. Gospel is good news. It's good news because Christ's final words on the cross were, it is finished. And if it's finished, there's nothing for me to add other than to receive what he's done for us as a gift. And the only way to receive a gift from God, Romans 4, 4 and 5, is to trust in the one that he has sent. And so our exhortation is for people who come under the convicting ministry of the Spirit as we're speaking to place their faith in Christ alone for salvation. If it's something you need more explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk, shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for your work and your word. And even your work to confirm to us why things in the Bible happen the way they do. You've given us so much evidence. Help us to not be callous and hard-hearted about it. But help us to walk by you, with you, with childlike faith. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said.